on WLFI Lafayette. This is a TV18 News special report. Live from Loeb Stadium in Columbian Park, I'm Mike Pickett. And I'm Jill Dittmeyer. And we're here to join a crowd to welcome home the 209 Supply Company who have just spent months and months in Saudi Arabia. They sure have, and their families have spent months in anticipation, and they're starting to stand up over here. They can hear the sirens. It's probably closer. as exciting for the people in the stands here at Loeb Stadium as it's been for any ball game that's been played here. I, I would think so. It's a, it's a tremendous welcome home in Lafayette. Uh, the troops arrived, oh, maybe... Uh, 45 minutes ago now, they arrived on buses from Fort Knox, and they went uh, to an area of McCarty Lane just off Sagamore Parkway, disembarked the buses, and I tell you, there was a great crowd there ready to greet them. The crowd lined the Main Street. I can imagine. I bet they're following them in, well, too, on I'm the way. I'm sure they are. I wish we could see right now from our vantage point that uh, the troops are just arriving uh, uh, at the area of Columbian Park and should be marching in here most any minute. And I'll tell you, it was exciting, and... and uh, if you saw some of the signs along the street, you couldn't help but have a little bit of a tug, you know? That's was, right. There's plenty of them in here, too. About three of the guys that are in this unit work at Alcoa. A uh, big sign in front of Alcoa saying, Welcome home to Rick Kokenberg and Irving Wynn and Homer Zink. Uh, three Alcoa employees who are part of the 209. They, all dis they got off the bus right across from work and <laughs> it probably looked pretty a, a good nice to them. nice greeting, I bet. Probably did. Uh, in fact, there's another group of young kids outside of the uh, Oakland school with the sign. They look like they might have been... Uh, almost nursery school or uh -huh. kindergarten age kids, but there were a group of them with a big sign, welcoming home Kevin Thedens, a, a sergeant in the 209. So it's a big day. Sure is. And it's a warm day too. I, it is I suppose very warm. they're used to this kind of a heat, <laughs> heat situation, but uh, uh, it's sticky and, and it's uh, gonna be a little bit tough, I suppose, to stand at parade rest there for very long. I'm not sure what the temperature is, but probably uh, a little more bearable than what they may be used to in the Persian Gulf. Probably so. It hasn't stopped uh, people from coming out there. There's quite a few people here, and there's more coming in by the moment. I suppose a lot of these people lined the route along Main Street, and there was a, a really good crowd between Columbian Park and McCarty Lane. Uh, they probably saw the group pass and then came by as we look now, uh, just looking down toward the left field line. And, and, uh, oh, there they come. and there's the crowd letting go. <laughs> They're beginning to be able to see them now. In fact, we can too, just passing uh, uh, the edge outside of, the of Columbian there. Park, right along the left field foul pole and making the uh, column left. And they should be momentarily coming inside uh, the Columbian Park entrance. They're led by the 42nd Royal Highlanders who have led their march and kept the cadence for them as they came down Main Street. And the family members can obviously see them now because they've all stood up and they're cheering. Looks like people walking right alongside of the troops, actually, as they're coming down Wallace Avenue now. And uh, you can see people moving along, probably joined them early on in the parade route and see somebody they know and love and marched in and tried to keep time. Here come the uh, Royal Highlanders now, just entering Loeb Stadium, and so moments from now, the troops, there's the They'll applause, the troops are coming into view. And the welcome home for the 209. This phase of the celebration is underway. It's both swing. The color guard here to greet them with members of various uh, patriotic veterans organizations, the Vietnam veterans, as well as the American Legion, the VFW, the various color guards of those uh, organizations have their flags now along the uh, third base foul line. The mayors of Lafayette and West Lafayette, as well as the county commissioners are moving into place. They'll all have some words of welcome for the okay. troops. Mm -hmm. Plenty of red, white, and blue and yellow all over the stadium. Balloons along the fence and, and the general signs. message being welcome, welcome home. home. We missed you. One says hi, bub. <laughs> we missed you. Glad you're home. Not sure what's holding them up. They, they made the turn, and uh, I can see the American flag is still moving, so they must be maybe catching their breath. It's quite a place. long walk for them to get here. Pretty good little march. Yeah. From uh, they, they got off their buses in front of the uh, aluminum workers hall and their alcohol recycling center there on McCarty Lane. 
marched down Main Street after taking a, a few minutes for a little hugging and kissing. Sure. And There'll be plenty more of that coming oh, up. There'll be a lot of that for <laughs> this day. Really. The American flag is approaching now the uh, left field bullpen where there's a a gate out to the parking lot that, that adjoins Columbian Park with Slope Stadium and the zoo parking lot. They're coming in that direction and they should be marching through the door most any time, marching through the gate. More people coming in, obviously the ones that were following them too. Could have a full house here by the end of this afternoon. Very well could. There were a number of people that were in the stands. Uh, maybe they were uh, just looking to get a good seat here rather than to be along the parade route, but uh, I drove the parade route about though, 1.30 this afternoon, and uh, there was a fairly nice crowd, but it built up, and uh, by the time they arrived, and I saw a few of them get off the bus and uh, greeted some of those I remember from my trip uh, over there with them, and uh, made my drive back. That, that crowd along the street had really grown. There was a good crowd there. I guess it's a pretty exciting moment for me, too, seeing some of those folks get I'll off the bet. bus that uh, photographer Paul Kucharski, who's on duty, and. Uh, Shot, taking some pictures of them getting off the bus. He and I made the trip to uh, Saudi Arabia with the 209. We flew over with them as uh, they left from Fort Knox, Kentucky, or from the airfield in Louisville, and, and uh, made a stop first in New York, and then a stop in Germany, and then uh, landed in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, at the airport there. And we spent oh, three or four days over there with them and got to know some of them fairly well. It's been a long here they time. come. Troops have turned to face the flag and they'll be in the Pledge of Allegiance and probably the national anthem at some point along here. I believe so. The Lafayette Citizens Band is going to play for them. Well, they're home lined up uh, the 209 Supply Company and what looks like four platoons just in their, dressed in their desert and camouflage uniforms when they left Lafayette. They were wearing the jungle green uniforms of uh, the Vietnam era, and now they're back. And there they are. Out of First Sergeant Homer Zink is moving out in front of his group. Second Sergeant. Ceremony should begin in any moment.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Loeb Stadium in Columbian Park. This afternoon, we are here to welcome home the 209th Supply Company returning from its participation in Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise for the playing of our national anthem and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. Company commander, please call your company to attention and give your company present arms. Company commander, bring your company to attention. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in a pledge to our flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will you please remain standing for the invocation to be delivered by Chaplain Malone. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Our gracious and loving God, there are times when we come into your presence with special concerns, and there are other times when we come in your presence with great joy. And today we come with joy and celebration, thanking you for bringing these people, these soldiers, these men and women, back from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, safely, soundly. We come too with heavy hearts today, praying that your peace may be upon that region and the entire earth. Now give us your strength and peace, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Company commander, please have your company standardies. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your presence today to honor the returning soldiers of the 209 Supply Company. The unit provided combat service support to combat units directly involved in the liberation of Kuwait. 
The unit was mobilized in Lafayette on September 27, 1990, and deployed to Saudi Arabia in November of 1990. Each soldier has received the National Defense Service Medal, and today each soldier will receive a lapel pin, commemorative cap, and special coin. In addition, other soldiers in the unit will receive other awards as a result of their participation in the exercise. Our congratulations go to each soldier for a job well done. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our first guest speaker, the Mayor of Lafayette, the Honorable James Reilly. Thank you very much. On behalf of the entire Lafayette community, the City Council, and all the elected officials, I want to extend to the 209th a hearty welcome home. Just, just to show you how proud we are, and if you didn't hear that, I'd like to ask the crowd on the count of three to give them a Lafayette welcome home. One, two, three. Welcome to you on that cold September morning when you marched out of the reserve headquarters to mar get on the buses and head, head away to Saudi Arabia. And we want you to know that your thoughts or our thoughts and our prayers were with you and with your spouses and families who suffered as much as anybody did with your absence here in our community. But we appreciate the job you did over in Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf. And our hope is and our prayer is that your efforts were not in vain that the peace and the hope and the tranquility and the new world that the president talks about will indeed come about where we can have peace and happiness throughout the world. So thank you very much and a job well done. Our next speaker is the Honorable Mayor of West Lafayette, Ms. Sonia Marjorie. Well, I'm proud to join with Mayor Reilly and on behalf of the City of West Lafayette and the City Council and all of the people in the entire community, we thank you for a job well done. And we say we have uh, thought and prayed with your families that you would be returned safely and we are very proud of you and your officers uh, for bringing you safely back. Uh, we've been concerned and followed everything that's happened in the Persian Gulf, and we do hope that peace will come finally to that uh, area of the world. But we do appreciate and all of your sacrifices, and especially the sacrifices of your family, and I know how happy they are to see you back, and they'd like to see you as soon as possible. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Keith McMillan, President of the Tippecanoe County Commissioners. I'd like to introduce another County Commissioner, Nola Gentry, in the blue dress here. You spent seven months in Saudi Arabia, a long flight home, a long bus ride home today, so if you will pardon me, I'll make this rather short. On behalf of Tippecanoe County, we welcome you home very sincerely. Thank you. I would now like to introduce the commander of the 123rd ARCOM Support Group, Colonel Warren Macaroni. Mayor Riley, Mayor Marjoram, most distinguished guests, I really come before you today with a deep sense of pride and a tremendous sense of honor. Taking part in this, home, this homecoming ceremony is uh, really a tremendous event for me, especially in consideration of how things turned out in the Persian Gulf. To the members of the 209, men and women of the unit, I want to extend to you 
My sincere appreciation for a job well done. When the call came, you responded. You came from Lafayette, West Lafayette, and many other communities around central Indiana. You, you accomplished your mission exceedingly well. And I'm convinced that you were prepared to, to even contribute to a greater extent had the need arose. Now, each and every one of you has made very significant sacrifices. You've made the sacrifice of being away from family, away from home, away from job, and some of you away from school. The sacrifices that you, such as you've just made that has kept our country free and great for so long. I think each of you well know that the price of freedom is constant vigilance. I'm personally convinced that the mobilization of the reserve forces proved to be the catalyst for the outpouring of public support. There wasn't hardly a town in the state of Indiana, or across the United States for that matter, who didn't have association with someone in the military. This magnificent effort that you took part in in the Persian Gulf, I'm convinced is a result of your monumental dedication and that of the other reservists who served with you. And most importantly, the support from your families back here in the United States. I'm particularly proud to be an American, but I'm most proud to have an association with you people out there before me today. I salute you on a job well done. As a reason. <clears throat> As a result of this Persian conflict and your dedication, let's hope that history will write that the greatest, our greatest victory was a battle that was not fought. A battle that wasn't fought because no adversary dare test our resolve again in the future. In conclusion, I also want to extend my congratulations and the honor to be in your presence of veterans from other conflicts, Panama, Vietnam, Korea, World War II, and yes, even perhaps from World War I. My hat is off to you folks. Congratulations. And the other group of people that I have to salute, and they're by, by no means the last group of people, and that's the group of folks who are back here, your families, the families of the soldiers that are standing here before me today. Their support was always with you, and our prayers were always with you. And I, and I congratulate them and thank them for their continued support. Now, to the 209th, on behalf of the 123rd ARCOM, welcome home. Thank you, Colonel Macaroni. I have a letter now to read from the United States Senate. It's to the members of the 209th Supply Company. On behalf of the soldiers of the citizens of Indiana, we take pride in welcoming you home to Lafayette after your duty in support of Operation Desert Storm. Congratulations on a job well done. Thanks to your efforts, the United States won an overwhelming victory and a just cause. We salute each of you for your dedication to your country. We cannot say enough about our appreciation for your distinguished service to our nation. And we cannot forget the sacrifice of the families who will not be welcoming home their loved ones today. Those who were taken from us have not died in vain. They have died demonstrating their skill and bravery so that others on this earth can live in peace. God bless all of you. Sincerely, signed Richard G. Luger and Dan Coates, United States Senators. Company Commander, would you bring your company to attention and open ranks so that you can receive your awards at this time?
Now the officials of the Army Reserve Command. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, while Colonel Macaroni and the distinguished guests are making their presentations, TV 18 will be rebroadcasting the ceremony tonight at 11.30 p.m. If you wish to set your VCRs, you can have a souvenir taping of today's ceremony. We didn't want to interrupt our own little plug there, did we? <laughs> I know. I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, VCRs set to that tonight, too. Well, sir, Colonel Macaroni, as well as the uh, mayors and uh, county commissioners, are making a pass through the troops. And it's going to take a few minutes as they give them each a, a singular honor. I uh, understand there's a, a coin that uh, symbolic of their service, as well as a uh, hat that uh, at least acknowledges that they took part in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So it's going to take a few minutes, and, and uh, we're going to stay with you. And, and uh, in fact, while while some of this happens, I want to bring in with us uh, uh, one of our colleagues at TV18, and uh, Kevin Sublett, who is also a captain in the 300th Service and Supply Battalion. And uh, uh, about a month around. ago, you were doing this. <laughs> turn around and show him what you look like, Kevin. Welcome home to uh, to Kevin as well as the others. In fact, Kevin. Uh, uh, was decorated for his service in the Persian Gulf War with the Bronze Star and uh, uh, as well as everything else that's being presented. So welcome back, bud. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here, too, to see the 209th come home finally. In fact, Kevin is a former commander of the 209th Supply Company as well. That's right. That's right, Mike. I uh, spent seven years with the 209th. Uh, first as a, as a lieutenant working with the platoons, and then I was uh, had the great honor of being their commander for two years. Uh, I gave up command about eight months before they actually got called to go over to the seas. And then they led you over there. The 209th was called, and they were actually activated in September, and it was in November that uh, they flew out at a Northwest airliner, a 747, and headed for the Persian Gulf. And while they were there during that first few days, the word came down. In fact, we relayed it because I was there with them that the 300th their higher headquarters had been activated. That's right. Uh, we we got into Saudi Arabia on the 6th of December, and our first location that we had to go to in the desert was called Log Base Alpha. And uh, you wouldn't know it, but the, the 209th was there already. They'd been there for almost a month. So when we got there, it wasn't like we were uh, we were friendless. We had our we had our people from the 209th that that uh, welcomed us in and showed us around and taught us a little bit about the desert before we had to actually experience it. What kind of facility was that? Uh, mainly tents. Uh, GP mediums or general purpose medium tents uh, where about 14 people could sleep in them. Uh, very primitive uh, outdoor latrines and uh, outdoor showers as we've all seen on TV. Um, you, you had to make your own life there and unfortunately you had to leave your families behind and I think that was the hardest part for everyone to get uh, adjusted to. Uh, it wasn't the heat or the desert or anything else. It was actually having to leave your families and go overseas to do something she didn't know what was going to go on. Tell, tell me a little bit about though, the, how, what happens in a unit like this. You were uh, you were a part of the same military organization for, the, for several years, and then all of a sudden, you're not just there for one weekend a month. You're living together. Do you, do, you, do you develop a different kind of a feeling for your for your fellow troops? Well, while we were in uh, in Saudi Arabia, we we had some time to experience that, and uh, we talked to several active duty units also. And I think that the reserves, the National Guard, were actually more prepared than the active duty. And the reason being is that we were uh, we we get to stay with each other. Some of these guys have been in the 209 for 19, 20 years. And uh, when you're on active duty, you only get to stay there uh, a max of three years in the unit. So you don't have the uh, camaraderie as you do in the reserves and the National Guard. Uh, so they just had to, to uh, pull it all together and become a unit. This is what it's all about when they go on active duty. Of course, if you look through the troops, you're also going to see that there are a number of women in the 209th. And uh, one of the things that I noticed right, right away when I went over there is that there's not a women's tent or a men's tent or a women's platoon and a men's platoon. There's a, there's a whole group of people working together. Was that a, the, is that a tough experience, or did, did people finally become accustomed to it? I, I think at the beginning you're, you're a little uh, leery of it, but, uh, but acting as a unit, you can't, uh, can't show favoritism to anybody. And the females in the units do not want that either. They want to be treated like uh, one of the other soldiers. Uh, they have a mission to do. They have a specialty, and, uh, and their specialty is very important to, the, to how the unit works. The unit came back actually on Saturday, and they've spent the... Uh, the past few days at Fort Knox in Kentucky. Uh, when you came back, you were at Fort Sheridan. What kind of things took place then? And I assume pretty much the same thing here. I'm sure there was. They, they might have had that first beer or so after leaving uh, Saudi Arabia, where it's dry. But besides that, 
I tell you what, the first thing you want to do is see your families and give them a big hug and say, you know, we're home, we're finally here in the United States. Uh, you take time to smell the grass and, the, and to hear the birds, because in Saudi Arabia you don't see any grass, you don't see any animals except for camels and sheep and goats. Um, some of the things that they have to go through, their uh, most important thing is your finance, to make sure that you've been paid correctly, uh, to acquire all your leave that you've, that you've gotten while you've been on active duty, and then to go through a medical screening to make sure that, uh, that you're healthy once you're leaving Saudi Arabia and coming back into the civilian life. Is there anything in particular that, that uh, they, were, they were worried about? Any, is there any con you know, particular concerns that, that, of what might happen on the transition? Uh, as far as uh, coming back into civilian life, it, it was tough for me to come back. We, uh, we were there for a little over five months on active duty for almost six months. And to come back and, uh, you know, I'm not married, but my family had to deal with all the stuff that I left behind, uh, my finances, and uh, they did a great job on that, so I'm happy with that. But uh, these people that are married, they have to come back and they have to, to, uh, to relearn who their spouse are and who their children are. Uh, they've had to pick up the role of, of the mother or the parent, uh, and, and they have to make all the tough decisions that they don't have their spouse there for. I think that's one of the hardest things they're going to have to, uh, to come a, uh, to adjust to. We, before we left Saudi Arabia, we had several sessions where you could uh, sit down and talk with the chaplain and, uh, and have group meetings about how the experiences you've had in Saudi Arabia, how you're going to go home and have to deal with your, with your families, because it's a very hard transition, and a lot of people don't make it. And that's unfortunate because they don't have the communications. It's, it's, it's going to take good communications for everybody to come home. And I know the family members here have been working on that. The, with the two and I support group, family members have been talking about it and preparing for this day, obviously, for a long time. But what was that like over there, knowing that they were over here together, gathering together in support of you? That, that had to have helped over there. I tell you, it's a great feeling because we received letters, and uh, we leave, received letters from, uh, from children in all the schools that were, were writing to us. And the support group did help uh, a lot because if you had problems, uh, be it financial or, or just uh, personal problems, if you're having a hard time dealing with your, with your spouse being in Saudi Arabia, they're there to support you. And as a service member, that made us feel a lot better. It wasn't, we didn't have to worry about our families. We had one thing we had to focus on, and that was what we were doing in Saudi Arabia. Let's talk a little bit about what was going on over there. I think like in, in advance of the war, I'm sure that it, that, that it was an, at least some sort of an exciting time. I mean, you were preparing to do something, and something you've been training for for a long time. And then it happened, and it was over, and you weren't coming home right away. And these guys have been there now for several months since the war. What kind of feeling must that be? What was it like for you? I, I, we were fortunate to come home about a month and a half after the ceasefire. Uh, I tell you, that month and a half was the longest time we ever spent in Saudi Arabia. Everybody was excited. The war was over. Uh, the ceasefire was signed, but we weren't going anywhere. Uh, we had a lot. Of, we heard a lot of rumors. As rumors always go around in the army and in any any uh, place where you have a large uh, uh, body of uh, people around. But but we had to, to deal with that because we'd have the letdowns of people say, "Okay, you're going home in two weeks. Two weeks come and you're still there." So you have to regroup and you have to get your heads together and your morale has to be built back up. And then that final day comes that they say you're actually leaving and you, and you climb on that plane and you take off and you look out the window and all you see is brown from the desert and it's a great feeling. <laughs> of course, one of the, the problems with this unit is that much of their mission over there was what would take place after the fighting was over, particularly in preparing tanks and, and to, to get, rid of, get those things sent back. Right, that's true, Mike. Uh, for the 209s, if we were if we were fighting in a Europe uh, scenario, they would go in and actually prepare the tanks that are in long-term storage that are being stored there to issue out to the troops when they come in. So they have a very big mission at the beginning. Unfortunately, in Saudi Arabia, we didn't have the tanks that were already over there. They were all being shipped over from the states. So when the 209s got there, they didn't have the mission that they were trained for, and they had to readjust and do some other things. Um, then at the end, after the war was over, and when we get when we uh, the 300th got ready to leave, their mission really became viable because they were taking all the, the tanks, if they were battle damaged or, or if they were all right, they needed to be shipped back. They brought them in, they, uh, they purged the tanks, they, they, they put everything into uh, to a long-term storage uh, stat, uh, state, and, and that's where the, that was their whole mission, to take the equipment, put it back in the long-term storage, and, uh, and they finally actually got to do their mission at the end. Must be a good feeling, I'm sure. But it must have been tough, but it must have been uh, difficult then because now it's a clean up to go home and it's for somebody else to go home. <laughs> right. Uh, since, since they were sent over so early, they became a uh, what is called a theater asset. Uh, we were a corps. We were with the 7th Corps. 300th SNS Battalion was with the 7th Corps. 
Uh, in every doctrine that was ever written in the books, they always say that the uh, theater assets are the first ones to go in, and the theater assets are the last ones to come out. <laughs> and unfortunately, they got stuck in the theater asset. And uh, I'll tell you, as a, as a former commander, it was very hard for me to go down and visit them. I had the opportunity of, uh, of going down with my driver and, and, and spending some time with the 209th around Christmas time to, uh, to say hello to all the people that I know in the 209th. And it was very hard for me to know that I was going home and they were still there, and they'd been there longer than we had. And that, that, that hurt our morale. It helped us because we were going home, but, but the morale of our troops in the 300s, we felt for the, three, for the 209th and for their families and what they still had to go through. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about what it's like coming home, though. You, you saw a little bit of this celebration and as, as they came in, and, and there had to be a sort of a chill there, no matter how hardened they are. But tell us about when the 300th came home. It was a similar kind of a welcome, a big crowd. You marched down South Street to the Reserve Center, and there were people along the street and yellow ribbons along the road. Did you, what, what did you feel? Colonel Jones, our battalion commander, he told us uh, that we're going to be marching in a parade, and everybody goes, oh, not a parade. You know, just let us <laughs> get out of these uniforms and put on civilian clothes and go home and relax. But I tell you, when we got off the bus and we saw the response of uh, what Lafayette and West Lafayette did for us, uh, it was it, it did it send a chill down your spine because we knew that everyone there was is in support of what we did in the Persian Gulf and it wasn't a uh, another Vietnam that we that, that wasn't celebrated and it made us feel very proud when we walked down the streets and we saw everybody with the yellow ribbons and the flags we had heard in our letters and correspondence and also on the phone when we were able to call our families that uh, of of the patriotism that was going on in the United States and we actually got the experience when we came home. And just driving down the road before the before this parade started, it, it still gave me the same chill because I saw, you know, welcome home to all night. Uh, you know, we're proud to be American, and that's what it's all about. I'm very proud to be here. Probably a bit of frustration too, standing out there and watching your family within six uh, feet of you, and you can't oh, yeah, get yeah. to them yet. <laughs> well, they, they actually they got a couple of days off when they got to Fort Knox, so they were able to see their loved ones, and uh, and that's real important. That that's important for morale and also for the, the well-being of their families. And now they get to go home, and I, I know they're looking forward to that. Certainly of course, are. even for you, as we sat here during some of this presentation, I noticed you kind of uh, dropping a few waves over to those guys who were supposedly standing at attention <laughs> and at parade rest. But uh, uh, it looks, uh, in fact, as we speak, and I'm sure we can probably get a look at this, the crowd that was so uh, uh, nicely Patiently seated waiting. inside the Lope Stadium bleachers is making a move out and moving in toward the uh, uh, surrounding the infield now almost is the. Uh, uh, the troops are still being reviewed and made a present, given presentations of uh, some, uh, some symbolic awards and, and rewards for their service. Uh, it looks like they're just they about like through a second in. platoon. <laughs> But, uh, so much for the seats in the stands. Right. Yeah. I tell you what, Mike, they don't hurry up here pretty soon. I think they're going to have a big mob on their hands. By the time this fourth right. platoon is honored, uh, I think that uh, they're not going to be able to tell who's the soldiers and That's right. who's was, the family. I was talking to uh, Chief Colby, uh, Kenton Colby, who's in the 209th, to his wife and, uh, and their two boys that were with them. And, and he hasn't had a chance to see his sons yet. Oh, no. And uh, I know they're excited about getting out there. Uh, Chief Colby's been in the unit, I believe, for 23 years, and he's an outstanding soldier for them. And uh, he's a great leader, and that's what helped over there, their leadership. Now, what happens now that the troops are back, your unit's back? What, what's in the future for the both of you? Uh, I tell you, I haven't heard anything from the, from the uh, Reserve Center. I think they're letting us uh, kind of get back into the, into the civilian world again, which is great with me. Uh, the first day that we have back for the 300 is going to be on the 13th of July. Uh, and that's, I think that's going to be a, a time where we come together and kind of uh, shake hands and give everybody a big hug. Because you have to become family with these people. You've been with them for six months. Uh, myself, I had seven guys living in my tent. I worked with them, I slept with them, I ate with them. And you have to become a family. And, uh, and to give that up as soon as you came back was kind of hard for me. Because you, you, you get such a, uh, a sense of family there and trust that you can always trust them to do anything and, and always do the stuff that you need done. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. I, I can't, I'm really excited about getting back and seeing everyone and uh, seeing what the future lies in for the 300. You, know, you kind of wonder, though, what we uh, don't want to talk down or talk too much about the, the problems that they're facing, but you have to wonder that how strong the reserves are going to be. Uh, some of the people that, you know, they didn't, I don't think they ever thought that they'd be going off to war when they joined the reserve unit and uh, didn't anticipate more than that, that one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. And uh, all of a sudden their, their lives are, for nine months, they're, they're completely changed and they're, they're military. And, uh, they're gonna get a lot of the GI benefits that perhaps they hadn't they expected, but I 
wonder if they're going to stick around. I'd say on top of the benefits, it has to it has to come with within. They want to be in the reserves. They're going to be there if they believe in what we're doing, and they'll they'll be there. And if they decide to get out, there's always the younger people that are always going to be coming along, looking for the benefits that the uh, that the reserve program will will give them in college education and things. So uh, I mean, the reserves are going to be strong no matter what, and may even be stronger with the deactivation of military troops uh, throughout uh, the army or the armed services. So I think there's always going to be a, a strong show there, at least I hope so, because that's where it's all going to go to. The reserves are going to have to become more trained and more qualified to do the job, so if they are called upon again, that they can respond quickly. And I'm sure the success of the mission itself and the welcome homes like this have, have to help. Absolutely. The, 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 I know what they have on their mind right now, and that's just to get out of the uniform. <laughs> They've been living in them for, for uh, too almost, long. almost nine months now. Some of them shouldn't be lived in to begin with, <laughs> and uh, and they're going to take some time. I'm sure that they won't have a, a drill for probably a couple months, and they get get to get to spend a little time with their family, and then they have to get back to work and uh, and have to adjust back into their uh, civilian life. And that's a tough uh, adjustment. Tough. There will be a Fourth of July celebration, though. The uh, the troops of the 300 will be here, and I guess that's uh, going to take place of one day of that weekend drill. I understand it, and and. Uh, the uh, 209, they, they've been invited if, if, they, if, the, if the individuals would like to. That's a week from today. They've been gone for nine months, and I'm sure they're patriotic and, and uh, will celebrate the 4th in one way or the other, but I would be kind of surprised to see very many of them here. I, I, I hope the people that are watching will understand that, too, because uh, they've gone through some extreme stress in their lives, and uh, it's not that, they, that they're not proud of being American or being a soldier, but that they need some time for themselves and for their families. Exactly. I think they're sending everyone back now to their seats now. <laughs> the, uh, as the ceremony went on, the crowd seemed to have uh, moved right in. In fact, that first platoon, uh, uh, they, they <laughs> sort of broken ranks just a little bit. And, and, uh, I, think, I think we have more civilians out there than we do military people right. now. I want to call in, if I can, uh, in, in a minute. I had his attention a, a short time ago. Captain Marvin Ellis is is involved in the uh, public affairs operation and and uh, with with the 123rd Army Reserve Command out of Fort Benjamin Harrison uh, you've been through one or two of these now at the the welcome homes and, and uh, even I, I would suspect uh, it, it's got to be exciting even just coming to the well absolutely Mike uh, this is probably about my tenth one that I've been to <laughs> from all variations uh, you know, heavy commands like this where you got 160 soldiers coming in down to where you only got 10 soldiers coming back. And it doesn't matter, it just seems like the uh, families turn out in masses. And you just wonder, you know, where are these people coming from? Are they all related to this one soldier? There's Everybody a lot feels of... like they're related to everyone That's at right, this point, exactly. I think. In fact, uh, Captain Ellis had a bit of a tour in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. He was uh, our escort as we made a trip over there on uh, uh, Veterans Day in November and spent a few days with the 209 Supply Company. And so I suppose this is a little bit special for you in that you spent some time living in a tent with these guys. Absolutely. I've adopted this unit as my home unit, as many of them I recognize with them. And uh, when uh, I heard of, you know, Scuds going in at Daharan or uh, anything that happened back in Saudi Arabia, I always immediately thought about the 209 because I felt that they were a special unit since we did spend time with them in the desert. There are still some units, uh, some reserve units from this area, this part of the country that are over there. What are we waiting on yet? Exactly. We've got the 199th supply out of Grissom Air Force Base. is still there. Their primary mission is to finish up bringing all the units back out of the country. So they've kind of got the mop-up detail where they turn out the lights, you know, dust out the, the interior parts of the buildings and turn the cat out and uh, finish it up before they get to come home. We should point out, though, that they were one of the last to go over there. Too. That's correct. They didn't start until February. So what, what do you see happening now with the, with the reserves, now that they, they've been through this sudden experience that I'm sure most of them hadn't anticipated when they signed up and when they joined? And, you know, they, they didn't expect to be nine-month veterans of, of the war, I don't think. Is, is that good or bad for the reserves for the future, for, particularly for recruiting? Well, the, I, I'm going to have to say this is good. It's, it's going to make every reservist think twice about his mission and his role and responsibility. He's not just going to come in for a week in drill and think, hey, I'm never going to be part of the total force with the Army. I'm going to have to look at my job a little more serious. And I also think that this is going to uh, take a uh, new light on the reserve program where people who want to come in the reserves, they're going to think twice before they come in and they're going to say, well, am I dedicated? Am I serious? Do I really want to go off to war? 
So I think we're going to find more people who are going to be dedicated to serious joining them. Of course, it's probably also going to say that for the first time since Korea, probably, the reserves are as prepared to take part in something uh, as, as they ever have been. There, there weren't that many reserve units called up as reserve units to go to Vietnam, so it's been a long time, really. Exactly right. Um, it was five years ago that Congress signed a bill uh, tasking more and more responsibilities or giving more responsibility to the reserves. I wanted to point out that 75% of our engineering assets are found in the reserve program, as well as about 90% of our medical units are found in reserves to, total, to support the total overall program. So more and more missions are being taken away from active duty and given to the reserves. Tell us a little bit about how the breakdown actually takes place in terms of military structure. We've been talking to Kaplan Subble with the 300th, and you're with the higher headquarters above right. that. How does it all right. shake out? Well, down to the 209th. Down to the 209th. Uh, like you pointed out, I am the public affairs officer for Army Reserve Command for the state of Indiana and Michigan. We are a two-star general command stationed at Fort Benjamin Harrison. We report to Fort Sheridan, which is 4th Army, which is an uh, has the responsibility of a seven state area. So to come back down from that command of Fort Sheridan down to Fort Harrison where the 123rd's yeah. at, then underneath us is the 123rd Provisional Command, which you have Colonel, Colonel Warren Macaroni here today uh, as their commander. Underneath the Provisional Command, which they are responsible for five battalions underneath them, you find the 300th Battalion. Then with underneath the 300 is the 209th. As well as the 199th, the unit that's still exactly right. We have four companies assigned to that battalion. I want to break away a minute from the from the military talk and get into a little bit of the the human talk. Uh, I walked into Lope Stadium. I saw a bunch of red-headed kids. There were four or five of them, it seemed like, saying, "Hi, Mike." And uh, their name is O'Connor, and their dad's been with the 209. What's your name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth O'Connor. Yeah. And you're from Lafayette. Yeah, from West Lafayette. From West Lafayette, and your dad is. Tim O'Connor. Tim O'Connor. And tell me a little bit about, you've, he's been over there with the 209th this whole time, huh? Yeah. How many brothers and sisters are here to greet him? I got, well, I've only got one brother, and my grandparents are here, and my cousins are here. Those are all cousins, huh? Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of them, a bunch of red-headed O'Connors ready to greet their dad. What's it been like? It's been hard at times because there's, like, you know, money shortage because there's not two people bringing in every week. But he does send us a check every two weeks, and so it's been kind of hard because it's emotional. Mm -hmm. And yet that, except for without having seen your dad for seven and a half months. Did you hear from him a lot? Yeah, he called like two or three weeks every, you know, two or three weeks, sometimes weekly during the war. Did, did you get a chance to see him at Fort Knox? No, but my mom did. You didn't, so you really haven't talked to him yet. Boy. Yeah, see, well, there was a mix-up, and he came back, and she was down there, and so I did get to see him. <laughs> so when you see him, what are you going to say to her? Well, we're going to meet you at our <laughs> <laughs> So what kind of celebration do you have planned? Well, we're going to, you know, she's going to settle down. He doesn't want to have a big party just right yet. He wants to get settled in again and, you know, get to know Greater Lafayette again because there's been a lot of things that have been happening before he left. And so... Christmas? Have you had Christmas yet? Well, my mom came down there with his presents, so he has had his Christmas, but we haven't. So he's going to come up and, you know, he's got our Christmas gifts and everything. So we're all going to, you know... And we also... My mom and my dad's birthday were missed, too, so... We're going to celebrate them, too. Well, Santa Claus It'll might come fun. tonight, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, but it has been, like, really hard. And we've been waiting for him to come home for a long time. And it's, my mom used to go to the support group meetings regularly. And so it, she said it kind of helped. And friends and family did ask her questions, and she said that it was one of the easier ways to mm -hmm. answer them. And I bet it was. And, and I tell you what we ought to do, as long as we're, we're still passing some time, uh, it'd be nice to get a hold of uh, uh, perhaps uh, Cindy Zink and some of the other people that were involved. Our family the, uh, are uh, the out of the field there. Group, but, uh, <laughs> she was standing right behind us, and they all sort of took over and, uh, took over the infield here. And despite the fact that that uh, they've been in, that they've been invited um, to uh, <laughs> to go back into the stands, nobody's heeding that advice very much, and uh, they're. Uh, they're moving now toward a, out of the field. In fact, as we speak, it looks like uh, uh, some of the emergency attendants are looking over uh, at least one person who has apparently uh, had a little too much of the heat. I tell you what, Mike, the problem is, is that they, uh, 
They have a tendency of locking their knees and they try and stand, you know, I, I believe it's one of the, the, the bystanders, but uh, it, it is hot out here today. Well, compare this kind of weather with, with the weather that you had over there. Is it what, Obviously, for a good part of the time, it was pretty hot. I tell you, hot's hot no matter where you're <laughs> at. Uh, the only thing is, in, in, right now, we're, we're having a lot of humidity, probably 80-90% humidity. We're in Saudi Arabia, we never got over 20% humidity. Uh, when we first got there in December, uh, it was probably 33 degrees at night. And it got to about 55 during the day, so it was very cold uh, both day and night. Then when we got ready to leave, it was 115 degrees during the day, and it would drop to 75 at night. But we still had to use sleeping bags at night because the temperature, our body temperature, came up to 115 during the day, or it felt like it. And then when it cooled off so rapidly, you'd have to use your sleeping bag because you'd become chilled at night. So uh, it, it's hard to, to imagine. Uh, it the, is, the because you only think of it as being hot over there. Right, you don't yeah. Think of the cold. yeah. The desert gets cold at night, yeah. there's no I, doubt about it. I certainly it. wasn't aware of that. I know when I made my three or four day trip, they were. They told us they would give us sleeping bags when we got there, and uh, we arrived only to find out, no, that wasn't really the case. And, and uh, that first night was awful. And uh, uh, but you know, you know, the thing that really got me about this group of people is that uh, when we got up shivering the next morning, and, and uh, were, they found out that some of us didn't have a blanket. It was amazing the collection of blankets and sleeping bags we had the next day. They. Uh, Half the people there, I think, gave us an extra blanket, and it was wonderful the next couple of nights. I think the I think main reason for that, too, is that, uh, is that everyone's just a little bit nervous about being there. They, they don't know the environment. Uh, they've never had to live in the desert. They never had to be away from their loved ones like they were, and they're trying to, to build that, that sense of, uh, of uh, camaraderie between each other, and, and that's, that's very important because if you don't have that, you're going to have a lot of problems, and you have to adapt and overcome your, your situation and your environment that you're living in. You know, that, that was another thing that impressed me, and we talked a little bit about this, is that uh, when, when we landed, or they set everybody up the first few days there. It was in a place called Cement City, and a, a dirty, dusty place, and a, a bunch of tents there, and, and uh, the tents held about 30 people, and there's probably 25 people, or there were probably 35 or 40 in each platoon, and, and so they broke up a tent, including the one that I ended up living in, and uh, with a few people from each platoon. And uh, those that had been there with the people that they had been working with all along were digging right in and uh, putting down gravel and trying to keep down the sand and uh, putting up partitions for the women to change and really trying to make home out of it. Those that they had broken up and said, well, we'll take five from this group and five from there and five from there and two lousy reporters. <laughs> and there wasn't much being done there, you know, and it was just kind of a sit around and, and, and uh, and not really get into it. That's, that's the thing you guys used to call unit integrity. That's right, and it's, it's also, you, you've taken away your leadership within your section, and that's one of the reasons that we don't split the females into another section or into their own small section, because we need that leadership uh, to guide the younger troops into, uh, into making the life uh, as, as, you know, as, as easy as they can while they're in a, a tough situation. Well, I hope we're not uh, causing too much consternation for the Miss Soap Operas. Uh, we should tell you that uh, <laughs> We're in the midst of uh, a presentation being made to each individual member of the 209 Supply Company. And there's that, a lot uh, of numbers to present There to. certainly <laughs> are. There are uh, originally about 160 or 170 that uh, uh, were involved in the initial activation. Some of them were able to come home uh, a, a little bit earlier, and uh, the rest of them came back as a unit on uh, Saturday. They landed at Fort Knox in Kentucky, spent three days there, and uh, then they made the move to uh, Lafayette just this afternoon. They came in by bus from Fort Knox and uh, landed to a, a big greeting on McCarty Lane over by the Alcoa plant, marched down Main Street, uh, a nice celebration, great greeting for the people. And, uh, and then they, uh, they made the move to uh, uh, Columbian Park where the ceremony is underway. In fact, we're gonna try to see if, if we can get the commander of the 209th. Well, while basically his formation has disintegrated, uh, Lieutenant Tom Winings, the, the captain of the, the commander of the 209th, is, is going to join us for a minute before they call your group back to attention. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, it's good to be back, Mike. This must have been a, a tremendous celebration for you. A great welcome. Oh, it was incredible uh, walking up Main Street and, and you see all the people off the side of the road. Uh, it, it really is great to be back and to see all the support that Lafayette's given is, is really, you know, another plus. And I guess after some note of a mix up in terms of uh, uh, a greeting taking place at Fort Knox and uh, to finally come here 
Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we left. Uh, they had enough fuel, and they, they canceled a couple extra stops, and we arrived six hours early. So that uh, so first thing in the morning, we arrived, and uh, they were on their way. So it's just a misconnect, but uh, but this makes up for everything. It really does. So tell us about the 209 for the last nine months. What's it been like? Uh, hot. <laughs> I hadn't changed. It's yeah, hot here. here. That's right, but it's humid here. We're getting used to the humidity. Um, we were busy, uh, definitely involved with the track vehicles that we had on the port, uh, keeping them cleaned up. I guess we just happened to have a mission that was easy to to hand off, to sign off to somebody else, uh, which made it easier for us to, to leave. Uh, we had less irons in the fire, so it was easy to, to tie us up. From the conversations that I had at various times with members of the unit, you didn't you weren't really that close to uh, to any real action, but uh, uh, tell me a little bit about the, the, the experience while the war was going on. Where were the bulk of the elements of the unit and, and what kind of things were taking place? Well, we were coming back and, and marching up uh, Main Street and went right past the dealership and they're all honking the horns and somebody commented, boy, I wish I had my mask because uh, <laughs> the, horn, the horns would go off and people would put on their gas mask. Uh, that happened during when the, when the fighting started, uh, the, the scuttle alarms would go off and everyone was just, they knew what to do and they became experts in, in, uh, in putting on their mask and making sure that, that everything went smooth. Um, they had to go out, they were, they were uh, processing vehicles out in the desert. Um, they did quite a bit of their own uh, at, time, at night. Some of the units were, some of the group detachments were so close you could hear, they would hear the bombings. Uh, you would, you would go out there and you could just, you could hear it, and you knew it was out there, and you couldn't see anything in front of you with sand, and you didn't know if there was, uh, what, what could happen. So uh, I was anxious for them. Uh, they said they, they liked it, they liked the peace and quiet, in that nobody bothered them. <laughs> was anxious the word? Is that how you describe what it was like? Anxious as in two packs of cigarettes <laughs> and a whole lot of coffee. <laughs> um, I was concerned because I didn't. It, there was there, it was hard to uh, it was hard to keep track due to the fact that uh, people were separated in, in the very you know uh, extended locations um, from the port all the way to uh, to our location at KKMC. Uh, where's tell me, where's that? That was uh, south of Hafer al Batin. Okay. <laughs> KKM. Where? It was at the King Khalid Military City. Okay. Yeah. Well, what kind of facility did you have? I know Kevin Sublet told us a little bit about when you initially over there about uh, living in tents. I, I explained a little bit about what it was like when you first arrived, but, but how did life progress for the 209? Well, we first moved, uh, when we moved to Log Base Alpha, we lived in tents. Um, from there, we, when we moved to KKMC at the beginning of the year, again, we stayed in our tents, uh, but there were closer facilities, the phone was available. Uh, we were very instrumental in setting up the, the post exchange, the, uh, the, the, the PX. Uh, 209th did that, I think, in the first week alone. They did a uh, quarter, quarter of a million dollars every day. Mm. So they were doing about three and a half million a week for the first couple of weeks. And our folks were involved with that. Uh, so the luxuries got a little bit better, but we're still living out in the desert and still visiting those big boxes that you, that, that yeah. you were so fond of oh, when yeah. you were with us. Uh, but at the uh, beginning of April, we moved down to, uh, down back down to the Dhamam Dahran area. And uh, we moved into fixed facilities. And the first night, people commented on how it was difficult to sleep due to the fact that they didn't hear the wind. Personally, I liked the fact that the wind was gone and we were in, in firm structures. Uh, the wind would get on your nerves, uh, just constant flapping. But, uh, but it got better when we moved back, but we were just as busy down at the port trying to, with a retrograde and cleaning up the, the track vehicles to get them shipped back. I asked Kevin his experience. Let me ask you your feeling. Is it did, leading up to the fact to the to the war? It must have there, there must have been a certain amount of I, I hate to use the word excitement, but at least this is what you were there for. This is what you were building up for, and then it was over. And you've been there an awful long time since. What's that last several months been like? It was a matter of, uh, especially from a leadership standpoint, um, telling these individuals that what they're doing is important that we just can't leave and, and they would see a lot of the combat troops leaving but that the force had to be reconstituted. We still had a mission, it was a very viable mission. Uh, sometimes it was hard to explain and people would go through depression or, or, or mood you know, because they wanted to go home too, I mean as well as I did. Um, but uh, the toughest thing was trying to keep them, you know, keep them busy, 
and that they were. And by keeping them busy, I kept their mind off of, you know, when are we going home? And they let me fight that battle at the, at the front office. Uh, they just did what they had to do, and I got us back home uh, when the Army said it was time to go home, really. <laughs> well, it, one of the things I remember is when uh, I was over there, the weather was, uh, it was tremendously hot in the daytime, and, and you were encouraging everybody to drink five big liter bottles of water a day. Now, uh, did, they ever, did you ever get to that? Did you ever get used to that? Did, did things change enough you, that wasn't so necessary? Uh, right towards the end, we had temperatures of about 125 degrees. It wasn't difficult to get people to drink water uh, because you just you would just get so dry so fast. One thing like the humidity, we've got moisture now. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have that. Uh, you would take off your hat and you'd have a, you know, a little bit of sweat and a minute later it's gone. It would just dry up. Um, so drinking the water was, was never really a problem. Uh, in fact, sodas were available and, and the near beer was, was available. And uh, so you drank a lot of that problem was I should have sticked with the water because I put a few more pounds on before I left. <laughs> uh, so what, the, what was the morale like? What was it like commanding this kind of a group that was over there that was away from home? Uh, they, they were citizen soldiers. They're not just, uh, they're not full-time army. What was it like being a leader of that kind of a group? I, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm still trying to digest it myself. Uh, I, there are times I'm saying, how did I even get all these people back home? Uh, how did they not kill me for <laughs> some of the things that we had to do? But uh, we had to do, um, things just needed to be done. And I've got excellent leadership in my senior NCOs and my officers, and I delegate a lot of responsibility, and they get it done. So that, uh, and then they would delegate to their NCOs and, and uh, squad leaders, and really push the, uh, the authority down, and everyone knew that the job had to be done. So, what, was, what was the plane ride back like and the ride up on the bus today? What were some of the conversations? Uh, and especially after everyone had seen their families that, that made it on Saturday. What, what was it that was, like? It was just, uh, you know, bus driver, hammer down. <laughs> <laughs> let's get out of here. Uh, let's get back. Uh, everyone was excited. Uh, just finishing up at Knox. Knox was, was super. They helped us out. They just processed us right through, made sure that all the problems were solved and, uh, and got us out in about four days. So that was super. You know, great folks down there. Um, the plane ride back was, uh, was fun. Um, they had movies and food and, and everyone was in, you know, high spirits and it was, it's, you know, everyone's still going, when is, where's this plane going to land? Is it going to land in the United States or, or is this a, a cruel trick? And, uh, when we arrived in Langley, Virginia and dropped off another unit, uh, there was a band there and, and families were there and we saw that and said, hey, we're going to get that when we get back home. Uh, Knox, there was a mix up, but we're back home now, and, it, and everyone's out here in full force, and everyone appreciates that. You know, the, I suppose that prior to the time that you were called up, you said the 209th around here, and nobody much knew what you were talking about. And, and over the course of the last nine months or so, uh, the 209th has taken on a real meaning in this, in this community. And I, I, I kind of want to ask what, what you feel about uh, what happened here. Did you really know the kind of support that there was? That, uh, that was taking place back in Lafayette and in Indiana and in, throughout the country. It was, it was great to hear how the United States had, had energized that, how, the support that, the, that, that everyone had for the troops. It, the kind of, uh, you know, we never did this for Vietnam and we never did this for Korea. Uh, it, it's time that the world looks at the United States differently and, uh, you know, they're not going to put up with, uh, with a bunch of things. Uh, I think I'm going to have to cut out here, Mike, because I think the colonel's going to finish up. We're going to try and get some semblance of order back here. Well, and good I luck to you, and welcome home. home. Congratulations. Thank you. Come on. Okay. Well, there we go. We've got a chance to converse a bit with the, a very com happy. the company commander, and uh, most, and any minute now, they, I believe, uh, they're going to be going back to the podium, and they're going to, well, maybe not now. It looks like that things are still kind of in some semblance of disorder. They, they're almost to the end, I think, down here. It's they're they're like trying they're to make their close. move through the uh, through the last platoon, uh, handing out the various commendations, the, uh, uh, particularly the, the, there's a camouflage cap uh, that says Operation Desert Storm, and uh, also uh, a coin. And I'd like, uh, hopefully, maybe before things can get, uh, uh, before we close, we might be able to get a shot maybe of that and get a, a look at exactly what it is that they are handing out to the troops. And I also
also see some Cokes and other things being handed out to the troops as well. There's a lot of family members down here. Well, it looks like maybe uh, this pass through the unit has been completed now and uh, they're moving some of the civilians and away from the soon to be civilians and uh, getting them back so maybe they can resume the ceremony. It's been a long time. I didn't catch what, exactly what time that started, but uh, uh, it took a, quite a while to pass through and, and uh, make the presentations to each of the individuals. And uh, well, they're still out there, but they should be wrapping up most any minute. Interesting conversation, having mm -hmm. heard first from the former commander of the 209th, uh, Kevin Sullivan, our colleague, and maybe we can get him back here in a little bit and uh, discuss a little more about what took place there. Uh, but then uh, to talk to the commander, uh, he was the last member of the 209th that I, that I saw when I left Saudi Arabia. Uh, he went into the uh, uh, hotel in Dahran where we were to drop off a vehicle and take off, and uh, we bid him goodbye and hopped on a plane and, and uh, uh, came back. And it was really a good experience just to be able to talk to him and see. You know, he said he put on weight. He didn't look too awful no. tan compared to... Uh, what he was before, but uh, he brought everybody home commander, safely. He certainly did. We have your and that was his job. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you First Lieutenant Thomas Winnings, commander of the 209th Supply Company, for his remarks. <laughs> I've never done this from the podium, so company. Eddie, uh, for those who uh, were at the Reserve Center before we left, the one thing that I promised everyone was that I was going to bring the 209 back. That I've done. I don't. I'd like to thank all the people who came out here to make our homecoming extremely special. Uh, the mayor of Lafayette and Lafayette City and the commissioner of the county, uh, the 123rd RCOM, but most important, all the families that came out here and have been a constant support for the troops that are over there and the troops that have returned. I thank the families and I thank everyone here. This time, I'd like to conclude the ceremonies with God Bless America.
I'd like to thank Ms. Eileen Hessian Wees for singing the national anthem and being joined by State Representative uh, Shiley Klinger for that as well. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the official ceremony. We invite each of you to meet our returning soldiers and join refreshments with them and their families at the 209 Supply Company. Soldiers of the 209 Supply Company, welcome home. Company Commander, take charge of your company. Captain Winnings is uh, trying to at least get some sort of order. You know, they can't just leave, I don't imagine. I don't they think so. they uh, have their equipment and their gear that has got them through nine months, and I imagine a souvenir or two. And uh, they must be on one of those buses. Uh, somehow or another, they're going to have to break from here and get together and, and pick them up. They're, uh, well, I'm not sure what they're going to do. But, uh, <laughs> I, suppose I think that, they've got yeah. a lot of people to help them carry yeah, things. Right. So. moments it will say fall out and they'll be free for a while There we go. First sergeant turns and there they go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they've broken it up, and the 209th are free, at go. least for <laughs> some period of time <laughs> now, a while. And, uh, and that wraps it up. And it was a great celebration, and I'm sure there's going to be many more all across the city for the next several days. As a matter of fact, they will be uh, on the 4th of July, stay right here in Columbian right here. Park. There will be a presentation involving... Uh, 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 involving both the 300th and any of those in the 209th who would like to show up uh, a citywide presentation of uh, uh, our heritage on the 4th of July a similar kind of a thing they'll march I believe from uh, the Alcoa plant or at least the Alcoa plant area down Main Street one more time a chance to come into Columbian Park and be honored mm -hmm. I think they were honored very well today a lot of hugging and kissing and smile on everybody's face here. And well, I want to tell you, too, we'll have uh, uh, lots of coverage of today's Welcome Home That's Ceremony right. on Lafayette Live tonight at 6. And then, particularly for those of you who uh, are looking for a souvenir mm -hmm. tonight at 12.30, uh, we'll replay this whole presentation, and, uh, a special little thing for the members, the families, uh, let them set their VCRs, and uh, I'm not sure how Relive long Relive it all again. <laughs> a bit longer than the 20 minutes or so they had told us it was going to last, so put a long tape in. But yes. uh, that's our little thank you to the troops, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. And we're, we're glad they're back, too. That's our report. I'm Mike Pickett. And I'm Jill Bittmeyer. Reporting live from Columbian Park. So long. If you're a diehard Cubs fan, you won't want to miss Lafayette Day at Wrigley Field, Sunday, July 14th, when the Cubs host the Houston Astros, with Lafayette featured in the pregame activity. 
For $36, you'll receive round-trip transportation on a chartered bus, a reserved seat ticket to the ball game, a box lunch, and a Lafayette Day t-shirt. You can pick up your tickets at any Payless supermarket. Join us for a great day of baseball, Lafayette Day, at Wrigley Field, July 14th. Sponsored by Payless Supermarkets and TV18. If you've been waiting for the right time to buy carpet, it's now. Rifer's Furniture is having their biggest floor covering sale ever. Save on famous Mohawk carpets, all styles, all colors, and all fibers, including DuPont Stain Master as low as $8.99 per square yard. Take advantage of tremendous half-price savings on all remnants and save on selected Armstrong floor coverings up to 50% off. Don't wait. Take advantage of special credit terms and save more than ever before. Save now at Rifer's Furniture in Lafayette. WLFI-TV now concludes its telecast schedule for this day. Our studios are located at 2605 Yeager Road in West Lafayette, with transmitter near Rossville, Indiana. WLFI-TV and studio transmitter links WCZ-72 and KSI-69 are owned and operated by WLFI-TV Incorporated, Post Office Box 7018, Lafayette, Indiana, 47903. We transmit on 494 to 500 megahertz, with an effective radiated power of 1,490,000 watts visual and 298,000 watts oral. WLFI-TV is a CBS television network affiliate. This is the seal of the National Association of Broadcasters. WLFI-TV is a subscriber to the standards and practices of the National Association of Broadcasters. The display of this seal represents WLFI-TV's pledge of community service and the maintenance of high standards of broadcasting. The entire staff and management of WLFI-TV bid you a pleasant good night and a good morning.